Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is August 3rd, 2022. It's great to be back this evening, and I'm really excited. One of the things I did during my month off was read several books, and, and I started with The Middle Passage, which is central to tonight's uh, work, but really I covered four books by Dr. James Hollis. He's a union analyst. I think he lives in Washington, D.C. now. He lived in Houston for a while. And he's a remarkable writer. I, I wanted to share a couple of things with you vulnerably, just to get, just to set some context for it. Um, I read one of his books years ago. In fact, one of our our most popular podcasts about couples work is based on his book, The Eden Project: The Search for the Magical Other, about couples and relationships. And I read it about twelve years ago. Uh, and I remember when I read it, how difficult it was for me to read. Um, the, the language is, is very dense. The, the, the use of, uh, of the language that he uses was, was very, very rich and very, very dense. And so I would read a couple of pages or three pages and then I would pause. So when I went back to reading Hollis recently, I've, I've enjoyed his quotes over the years, but when I went back to reading Hollis over my, over my break, I noticed how easily it came to me. And the reason I'm sharing that with you is because part of that is my own work. Part of that is, is. Not so much, I mean, I think there's a little bit of more familiarity with Jungian language, with analytical language, but I think it's also because of my work. And so tonight, I'm going to be talking about uh, what, what James Hollis talks about, which is a, a, a Carl Jung idea of the second half of life. It really t comes from uh, about four books, although I have a couple of quotes that, that I'm not quite sure what, which of his books they came from that I stumbled upon today. Uh, the one that's primary is the middle passage. And then I read, secondly, Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life. And third, I read Living in an Examined Life, Wisdom for the Second Half of, of the Journey. And then finally, The Broken Mirror, Refracted Visions of Ourselves. What this idea is, is this idea that we get to a certain place in our life where we, we let go of the old. We let go of, of our crusades. We let go of our, of our projects. We let go of our ideas. Um, we let go of all the shoulds, all the, the, the ideas that we were handed in our childhood about what we should do, think, feel, who we should marry, what we should enjoy, um, what career we should live. And we wake up to this part where we want to find something deeper, something more meaningful. It's not accidental that I'm sharing some of this with you this evening um, because many times the second half of life correlates to raising teenagers. And I think part of the call to this deeper meaning is related to the call that comes when we have somebody that we care about that's struggling. So if you're new to the Evoke Therapy Program's broadcasts, again, I, I warn this, I give this warning on occasion. I, I want to explain to you that this is not a beginner's broadcast. This is not starting at the beginning. But my job, I think, is to take some of these complex and obtuse ideas, concepts, and to make them as accessible as possible. The second thing that I wanted to share that was just real um, is I've been back to work for since Monday. I've been back to work uh, uh, just a little bit, just a few days this week. And of course, coming off vacation can be sometimes, I, I used to call it the post-vacation blues. You know, there's this feeling that I, I just, um, just not quite ready, but I'm definitely ready to come back. And I learned a couple of things. And part of it, you know, I, I found some context in James Hollis's readings um, that, that discussed this was part of the meaning I get out of my life is the work that I do. These podcasts are part of my meaning. The psychotherapy that I do, the, the therapeutic training that I do, running the intensives that I run, all of that becomes a part of my life, a part of my meaning, it gives my life richness. I'm so grateful to have, to be able to mix my vocation with my work and to, to do what I love, to do what my heart's desire is. And it teaches me every day. Um, the other part that I wanted to share with you was, is, is a, a, a humbling experience I had. And the humbling experience I had was being a full-time or a stay-at-home father, stay-at-home stay -home parent, I should say, is difficult. And, and with all of the advice and education that I give in, in parenting, I, I need to tell you all this evening that it's hard. And part of James Hollis's work, part of this idea of Jung's idea of the second half of life is that we break through our denial. We break through the illusions that we're healthy, 
that we have it all figured out, that our past isn't isn't haunting us, isn't affected, affecting us. Hollis talks about constantly in, in his writings, one of the, the terms or phrases that he uses, the images that he uses, he talks about that we, we sleep in history's unmade bed. We haven't sorted and cleaned up things from our past, and they come out in our lives on a daily basis. One thing my therapist taught me many, many years ago working in, a, in academia was that sitting around the, the conference room table at a university or a boardroom for that matter, really what we're working out is all of our childhood issues. So tonight, today, with this broadcast, with discussing what it means to be in the second half of life and finding meaning informed by James Hollis's work, I, I want to just talk about this idea in the beginning that we're all in this together and that I don't have it figured out. But, but Hollis talks about the goal of therapy, the goal of waking up to, to who we are is to change from neurotic suffering to normal suffering, to everyday suffering. And, and what does that is meaning. When we add meaning to our life, our anxiety and, and our, our, our seemingly meaningless, endless suffering somehow becomes something that we can bear just a little bit lighter. So with that preamble, let me get into what, what I put together was a list of quotes from mostly the middle passage, but some from those other books. Uh, I, I have a quote or two of my own, and then I have a quote to begin from The Knight in Rusty Armor. For those of you that might not be familiar with The Knight in Rusty Armor, written by Robert Fisher, this is about an allegory of a knight who, who ends up with his armor stuck to him. He can't get it off. So he goes on a, on a journey to see if he can get his armor removed. And he's told that he can find Merlin, the magician, in, in the forest. And that if he finds Merlin, that Merlin can help get it off. So in his, in his desperation, his, his feeling that he might have to die and, and lay down and just starve to death because he can't even get the mask off of his, his face to feed him, he, he has an, a, an appearance from Merlin. And this is their early exchange. Goes like this. Warily, the knight climbed down from his horse, says to Merlin, I've been waiting, I've been looking for you, he said to the magician. magician. I've been lost for months. All your life, corrected Merlin, biting off a piece of carrot and sharing it with the nearest rabbit. The knight stiffened. I didn't come all this way to be insulted. Perhaps you have always taken the truth to be an insult, said Merlin, sharing the carrot with some, other, some of the other animals. The knight didn't much like this remark either, but he was too weak from hunger and thirst to climb back on his horse and ride away. Instead, he dropped his metal encased body onto the grass. Merlin looked at him compassionately. You are most fortunate, he commented. You are too weak to run. This encounter with, with Merla, this, this initial or early stage, I, I might say, of the hero's journey, the journey to, to discovering who you are and, and discovering um, peace in this life, meaning in this life, meaning that, that can give your suffering um, some balm, some, some healing, um, oftentimes is preceded by the moment that we are too weak to, to try anything else. We've come to this part in our life where we're not willing to try our old ways. We've, we're exhausted by them. And we're so exhausted by them and pained by them that we're willing to try something new. The reason I started off tonight's broadcast with a quote from the Nine Rusty Armor is this. James Hollis doesn't mince words. And so I'm going to do my best this evening to share his, his quotes and his information without apologizing. And, and I'll, I'll say this on the outset. The, the information that, that Dr. Hollis is giving us, in my opinion, is it's not perfect. All, all of it's not perfect, but it is absolutely wonderful source material, material about what it means to be a human, what it means to grow up and become an adult. But he doesn't say it oftentimes in a, in a soft way. Sometimes he says it very bluntly. That might be difficult for folks that struggle with guilt and shame. As I said to my mother, the story I've, I've told for, for years now to illustrate this, when my mother came up to me after a, listening to one of my talks and she said, I'm beginning to feel that I should feel guilt, that I should feel guilty for the ways that I treated you and your brothers growing up. And I said to her, I don't need you to feel guilt. I can't help you with that. 
If that's if that's what what it causes you to feel, I, there's nothing I can do with that. I don't need it for sure. In fact, I explain. I think the guilt that you've been conditioned and taught to feel as part of a moral life is actually going to get in the way of you seeing yourself. So as I've been thinking about doing this broadcast this, this evening, I've been thinking a lot about how some of the truths, like like Merlin says to the night here, some of the truths that, that we um, hear before we're ready to hear them can cause us to, to defend ourselves, to feel like um, th that there's something to protect. Remember, when somebody teaches something like what Hollis is teaching, it's not a, a, a shaming message. That's not the intent. The intent is simply to describe from his perspective what he sees in, in human beings and development in children. And remember this always. For those of you prone to guilt, this is the last thing I'll say before I, I go on to some of the other slides. Um, the, 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 the guilt that you feel as it might feel paralyzing. Remember that in all of these stories, you are also the child of parents. The things that we talk about that get that we do to our children, we 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 all know, and I talk about this all the time. I try so hard. I tried so hard this month to be an involved, invested parent. But we inevitably dent our children and make mistakes. And there's no escaping that. You either retreat into denial or you embrace the, the, the imperfect nature of this journey. And there is nothing in this life that I've experienced or, or been told I've experienced secondhand that is more difficult and at the same time more important than parenting. There is nothing more difficult and important as parenting. You are sure to fail at it. And while... You might get some comfort or some tools or some, from some insight from, from me or from others that you read or, or listen to. I, I want to state at the outset, my goal isn't to fix you. My goal isn't to give you all of the answers. My goal is to help you to discover the meaning in this part of your life as you grapple with, with a child or a loved one that's struggling with mental health or addiction. From the middle passage, James Hollis says this. He says, Jung puts, it, puts parents in a difficult spot when he wrote that they, quote, should always be conscious of the fact that they themselves are the principal cause of neurosis in their children, unquote. And then he says, this is cited not to instill guilt in parents. Again, it's very direct. What I have come to understand about myself is I am the primary cause for my children's neuroses. He goes on to talk about parental substitutes, like our, our culture and teachers and peers. And those all have their part in, in the play, all have their, their part in the drama. But, but since I have no control over them, and since I occupy such a tremendously significant space in my child's psyche, the only thing that gives me power is to see my participation in the problem. And as we heal and grow and evolve and, 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 and repair parts of ourselves, there's no guarantee that anybody around us, including your children, will be fixed. The only guarantee that you have from your own healing is your own healing. Speaking of the second half, half of life, Carl Jung's idea that James Hollis talks about at length. He says, but such is the first adulthood, full of blunders, shyness, inhibitions, mistaken assumptions, and always the silent rolling of the tapes of childhood. If one had not set forth and made those mistakes and crashed into those walls, then one would, not have, then one would have remained a child. Reviewing one's life from the vantage point of the second half requires understanding and forgiveness of the inevitable crime of unconsciousness. If you're new to this, that's part of the call is to forgive yourself for the, for the crime of unconsciousness. I love that part of the quote. And until 
something as as powerful as the the suffering of a child that we love as much as we're capable of loving. But when something like that moves us, it's 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 really the it's only something that powerful for most of us that can cause us to let go of old things that kept us uh, us safe, old rules, old ideas. I talk about this in the audacity to be you, that that part of enlightenment is letting go of old relationships, old ideas, old contexts. Uh, You know, when I talk to therapists, when I teach young therapists, I try to instill in them this idea that the advantage you have is that you can't even pretend to know what it's like to be a, 45 year old parent of a teenager, if if you're not that yet. You don't know what it's like to be a co parent with a parent who seems wholly uncooperative. Or to be the co parent of a parent where you've lost all of your, 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 your parental rights because of the, the, the custody agreement. And you don't know how to fix these people. All you know how to do is create a context that facilitates healing. And then each person has to step into that, that context and do their work. I'll talk about this more tonight, but, but the, the message that I got from all of the, the books I read by Hollis this month, the message that I got over and over again is, and I'm saying this to you, to you listener and watcher, your happiness is your responsibility. Your life is your responsibility. It's not your child's. It's not your spouse's. It's not mine or, or, your friends, or your parents. That is, in essence, one of the features of this the, this second half of life, this second adulthood, is taking responsibility. And that doesn't mean, in fact, it's it's exactly the opposite. It doesn't mean that we shove those, those, those rolling tapes from childhood into a drawer somewhere in the storage room and close it. It means that we explore them. So the middle passage is that time between the first and the second half of life that we're invited to. I love this quote because it says it so simply. It really is the one of the, the, the main theses of the audacity to be you of the work that we do at Evoke, which is this is from James Hollis, the middle passage. He says the truth about intimate relationships is that they can never be any better than the relationship we have with ourselves. I'm going to talk about it in a couple of weeks when I talk about our different intensive programs, but I'm going to say it emphatically here right now. You, you do your work. You explore your history. You, exclu- you explore the, the, the inner landscape of your psyche, of your emotional world. And, and when you do that, or as you do that, you're more, you're more capable of having a relationship with others around you. That's why in the audacity to be you, the first chapter, once I get into the curriculum of it, the first chapter is finding you. That's why when couples or or families call me wanting to do an intensive because they're dealing with a child, an identified patient who's struggling, or maybe the marriage is struggling in or outside of the the context of co-parenting. And I'll at least ask them to consider the idea that coming to a, a personal intensive might be enough. And if it's not enough, it's definitely a stronger foundation uh, upon which to build the the concepts of parenting and co-parenting and marriage. You know, I've been doing this for a long time, two or three decades. And and I can say with with no judgment, with 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 the, with the realization that I'm on this journey with you, that this is the work. You want to help your child who's struggling with alcohol abuse or self-harm or anxiety, even somebody, the, your child on the spectrum, the autism spectrum, with learning difficulties or ADHD or impulsive behavior, behavior or impulsive rage, the list could go on. You want to help them work on you. I'm not saying that, a, that something like a wilderness program that, that Evoke is, is not relevant. We, we, we take the child, we, we surround them, we keep them safe. 
we, we start to help them. And while we do that, you become freed up to work on yourself. And it's not a direct cause and effect by every little, that's one of the, 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 the transitions into the, the second half of life. And, and James Hollis refers to the, the story in the Old Testament of Job and, and talks about how that story was told in other cultures and at other times also. The same story about a, a, a man who was upright before his creator, did all the right things, but still bad things happened to him. The first half of life, we believe that if we do good things, that if I love my partner enough, she'll stop drinking. That if I love my child enough or, or attend to them enough, I can shape them up in, in the way that they need to go. And the story of Job is to tell us bad things happened to good people. And the idea that we were taught when we were young, that if you do good, good things will happen. And if you do bad, you'll be punished for it, is a fairy tale. When in reality, good is its own reward. Bad is its own punishment. He talks a lot about individuation. Individuation is becoming who you are. And, and when I talk about individuation, it's inevitable. Inevitable when I talk about individuation. People start to hear me talk about this. this they think that we're talking about this idea that sometimes gets taught about culture, that Americans are hyper-individualized. That's not the case. That hyper-individualism that people critique and criticize that's a mutation of healthy individuation. Individuation is knowing what I what's okay for me, knowing what I want, knowing when I'm hungry or when I'm tired or when it's right for me to go outside or whether or not I should give my child another hour this week on their social media apps. That's what individuation is. It's 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 pulling apart the the ideas, the messages that, that we were taught from our childhood that we don't even question. Some of you that are on this path know exactly what I'm talking about because you know that, that you're unlearning things from your childhood. Hollis says, the only prerequisite or the only requisite to entry into the middle passage is to have discovered that one does not know who one is, that there are no rescuers, no mommy or daddy, and that one's fellow travelers will do well to survive themselves. When, I, when, when, when somebody enters the second half of life, when they're, you know, at least partway through the middle passage, the sign that I hear in them is when they talk about how imperfect they are. Reading James Hollis's his work over and over again, his four books on, on my month off, I, I realize I'm worse off than I thought. I'm more dented and compromised than I thought. I'm not, a, not as good of a parent as I thought. So let me be clear about that. I realized today, August 3rd, 2022, I am more aware of my dents, my bruises, my limitations, my mental illnesses, issues, than I was on June 30th when I last spoke to you or June 29th when I last spoke to you. That's what this awakening is about. And it, it doesn't come, I don't feel horrible about it. I don't feel guilty about it. In fact, those demons or those sentinels, as I like to call them, were the ones that I had to do battle with to, to, to get that information, to allow that information in. Because if I was, if I was haunted by guilt and shame and, and remorse and regret, all I would do was continue on the path of thinking that I was better than I was. Every single thing that I teach you about, in fact, the things that I spend the most time teaching you about, you would be wise to understand that those are things that I still struggle with. Those are part of my practice, my mental health and wellness practice. I love this idea that, about becoming a person. My therapist talks about it all the time. Uh, Hollis says in uh, Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life, he says, to become a person does not necessarily mean to be well-adjusted, well-adapted, approved of by others. 
It means to become who you are. We are meant to become more eccentric, more peculiar, more odd. We are not meant to just fit in. We are here to be different. We are here to be the individual. As you start growing and changing, you will have fewer and fewer peers. Most people don't wake up to the second half of life, and it has nothing to do with chronological age, although it's, it's, it's rare that it happens in young adulthood. It usually happens around 40, give or take. But you're not going to find crowds of people telling you that you're, you're doing a good job. And, and, and when you are, are living in the second half of life, you don't have the urge or the need to explain to them your philosophy. Your parents, your siblings, your community will probably tell you that you're doing it wrong. Even though you're improving and getting better and becoming more aware. They'll find, because it's been a part of your, your, your entire life, they'll find those things that, that have kept you, have, that have kept you uh, held back. Phrases like you're being selfish. Or you're, you're, you're not consistent enough. Or they just need strong boundary or whatever it is, right? Becoming a person means being who you are. The goal of therapy is to become who you are. And with that comes more wisdom than, than, than we can imagine, more, more, more a sense of empowerment than we can imagine, more freedom and more peace. I love when he talks about projections. I think we think about projections as a fairly static process where we take parts of ourselves that we don't see and we project them onto or see them on other people. But this description of, of projections that I'm about to read to you is much more dynamic than that. And I love it that he talks about marriage. He also talks about this with career and he talks about this with parenting. But I thought the part where he talks about it with, with marriage is so profound and powerful. He says, of the many projections possible, the most common are those onto the institutions of marriage, parenting, and career. Regarding marriage, he, he explains, perhaps no other social contract has so much unconscious baggage imposed upon it. Few at the altar are conscious of the enormity of their expectations. No one would speak aloud the immense hopes. Quote, I am counting on you to make my life meaningful. I am counting on you to always be there for me. I am counting on you to read my mind and anticipate all of my needs. I am counting on you to bind my wounds and fulfill the deficits in my life. I am counting on you to complete me, to make me a whole person, to heal my stricken soul. I know for me, we, we've talked about in my marriage, marriage 1.0 versus marriage 2.0. And marriage 1.0 was riddled with these kinds of projections. By the way, to give you an idea, marriage 2.0 isn't to be free and clear of all of them. It's to be constantly aware of, reminded of, and available to the idea when it, when it appears in my life with my wife. That, 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 that I believe, because I learned it in childhood, that my job is to make her happy. And, and subsequently, I also believe unconsciously from my childhood that it's her job to make me happy. When in reality, it is my job to make me happy. It is her job to make her happy. It is not the child's job to make you happy. They simply cannot do it. And to the extent that they are unconsciously enrolled in that task, it will cost them. And it will be manifested in mental health issues. And so our jobs as parents is to go find sources of support. Therapists, support groups, 12-step groups, yoga, meditation and mindfulness practices, right? community. Find people that can boo you, boo you up, that can support you, that can help you. And then you come to, they can listen to you. That's underrated. They can listen to you share the, the, the excruciating pain 
and anxiety that comes with loving somebody like a child who's struggling with mental health or, health or addiction. So you take care of yourself in those places. So that when you show up to the marriage or when you show up to work for that matter, when you show up to the child, you can be there for the people that you love and that you serve professionally. And, and, and I've said, and I said this in the audacity to you, show me a couple that that's considering divorce or is in the, the process of deciding or, or, or separating. And let me hear their story of their falling in love. And I will show you this. I will show you where the, the, the issues that have become chasms in their life and their relationship started off as cracks in the foundation in the first place. And by the way, some of the quotes that I just read to you, you know, I'm counting on you to read my mind. I'm counting on you to always be there for me. Not only are these unconscious, some of these are in wedding vows. Some of these are in, in the romantic movies that we look to and, and, and that, that they serve to idealize this idea of this, this fusion between two people instead of this connection between two people. To have intimate relationships, to love other, the other person, and Jungian therapy and other therapies, they often refer to the other person as a generic other. To love other and, and their otherness, you have to have a, a, a sense of yourself. The minute we talk about intimacy and connection with anybody, we, we have to start with or consider individuation, differentiation, selfhood. I have this, 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 this first quote is from the middle passage and the second quote is from something I shared on social media that, that I wrote as my own, but really it came from my wife, but she didn't want credit for it, but I'm giving it to her anyway. From James Hollis, he says, the paradox, the paradox of individuation is that we best serve intimate relationship by becoming sufficiently developed in ourselves that we do not need to feed off of others. The, the prerequisite for intimacy is selfhood. The prerequisite for, for intimacy is not coming to the other person needing something. but coming to the other person wanting to, as Rilke, Rilke says, the, the poet says, wanting to share your solitude with the other person. My wife said it this way. She said, for deeper connections, we don't constantly come to our relationships hungry. We come with full bellies, take responsibility for our own happiness and learn to find multiple sources of support. When we do these things, we are more capable of love and are able to attend to the needs of others rather than constantly asking the other to take care of us. If we come to our relationships, he said, hungry all the time, we will end up eating the other person. So we learn to feed ourselves. We learn to find multiple sources of support. Of course, our spouses and we to them are, are, are sources of support. But as anybody listening to my voice knows because of the experience that they have with it, you'll know that, that at times you have competing needs. One of you gets home from work or both of you get home from work and you're both exhausted and there's nobody to help either one of you. If one of you gets home from work and one of you has been, been there with the kids all day, you know what that feels like. Virginia Satir, a, a, a prominent family therapist back in the 1970s and 80s, called it the witching hour. When people come together with competing needs and there's really nobody to feed anybody. The capacity for growth, Hollis explains, depends on one's ability to internalize and take personal responsibility. If we forever see our life as a problem caused by others, a problem to be solved, then no change will occur. I want to make two points about this quote. 
part of what we're doing with your children is helping them transition from it's your parents' fault to it's your responsibility. Everybody's dented by their parents and all dents and bruises are worthy of exploration and consideration. But now they are there. They are yours. I, I have four children, some of you know, and I love them as much as I'm capable of loving another human being. And I've dented all of them in many and various ways. Different for, I've dented some of them very differently than I've dented others. My wife has done the same. And I'll be gone soon. They'll be off on their own soon. And it's their life. And me torturing myself with guilt and shame because I made mistakes, not only does it not help, but it actually causes the problem to continue. So if you hold on to your guilt like a comfort blanket, because somehow feeling guilty makes you feel more moral, it's a lie. Guilt prevents awareness. Guilt leads to denial, repression, and a host of other defenses. It's only when we learn to cast off the guilt. And in some ways, Hollis makes that assumption in his writing because that's, that's why he's, he shoots it so straight right to your heart. Because he's not, when I'm writing, when he's writing, we're not doing therapy. He's not doing therapy with us. He's telling the story of his experience of being a psychotherapist, an analyst in his case, for, for 40 plus years. So for our children, we can be accountable, we can listen, we can be empathic, we can take ownership if we've getting, gotten rid of our guilt to, to enough. But ultimately, it's their life to live. And then the second thing is it's true of us too. I don't think most parents would think this way. I'm going to say something that I might not get away with, frankly. But if you're waiting for your addicted, depressed, anxious child, child that struggles with executive functioning, ADHD, fill in the blank, autistic child, if you're waiting for them to improve, for you to be happy, they feel it. They feel that you've abdicated your responsibility. It comes out in everything that you do and say. So you got to go somewhere else to deal with that, that grief, that pain, that sorrow. And if, and if, and when you do, you let your children be free to figure it out. I love this quote. It reminds me of a, a, one of the poems from Khalil Gibran that we, that I often refer to that we use at some of our workshops. James Hollis says, nevertheless, the gap between the expectations of parenthood and the frictions of the family, a family life caused further pain to those in the middle passage. The disappointment can only be assuaged if one remembers that what one wished one's parents had known, that the child only passes through our bodies and our lives and root to the mystery of his or her own life. When the parent at midlife can accept this, the ambivalence of parenting gains its proper perspective. I know for some of you to, to, to think about your children passing through your bodies and your life in route to the mystery of their own life might feel like, again, I'm saying don't care. It will feel like not caring because what you have been taught, what you have been taught is caring is not caring. It is dependency or codependency. And this differentiation, this individuation, this taking responsibility for oneself by sorting out one's own history and one's own life. That's the greatest give, unarguably, that you can give to your children. As Carl Jung said many times, or is quoted often, have said the unlived life of, of a parent is the greatest burden for a child to bury. And when I say unlived life, I'm talking about this 
middle passage, this second half of life. Not blaming your bosses or your spouse or your children for your unhappiness. As one great writer said, after years of traveling the world looking for gurus and going to therapy, it wasn't until, she said, I realized that the source of my suffering was the way that I was living my life. It wasn't until then that I found freedom and peace. And so if I were your therapist and you wanted to talk about the story of your child, I would listen as long as you needed to tell me. I would listen for, essentially, I would listen for as long as you wanted to talk about it. But I'm not listening to you tonight. I'm talking on a, on a webinar and on a podcast. And so what I, I will say to you is, your job is to find peace, meaning in the suffering and anxiety that you feel for your child and the grief that you feel for your child. When I go to in-service in our wellness program next, next two weeks, I'm doing, I'm teaching in-service. I'm going to say that to them. I'm going to say, these children are difficult and challenging. But if you listen and you pay attention and you look, you'll learn more from them than, than they'll ever learn from you. And sometimes when I teach that, somebody says, yeah, but my child tried to take their own life or my daughter is drinking herself to death or my son is on the autism spectrum disorder, low functioning, or, and they give me a list of, of behaviors. I think wanting me to go back to that grief and that sadness and that empathy, which I have. But this broadcast tonight presupposes that that's already there. And with that, we are left with our own lives. I love what, what Hollis says in Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life. He says, if the ambitions of use of, of the first half of life, which Nietzsche and, and Jung and Joseph Campbell refer to as the lion stage of our life, the time when we're out there making our way in the world, making our family, building our, 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 our home, making our career, right? That's the lion stage. If the ambitions of youth, many of which we are able to achieve, truly serve the soul, then we would see a lot more happy people. Marriage, this is not just me talking. This is Joseph Campbell and James Hollis. Marriage and parenting is, is essentially um, a grand lesson of, in suffering. And since the goal of, of mythology, of religion, according to these folks, of, of our lives, of therapy, is, is finding out who you are, since that's the goal, most often the only way that we can have something powerful enough to create that transformation of consciousness, that's a specific phrase that is used, that I use, and that they use, the only force that's strong enough to cause that transformation of consciousness is suffering. I don't talk about my relationship with my wife um, as much as I talk about parenting, just because the primary audience that I speak to on these broadcasts is, is a parenting audience. But I will tell you in my second half, I love my wife more than I did the first half of life. And I've struggled more. But the struggling that I do now is authentic and it's mine. And there's nowhere else to go because the only person I would be running from is me. And, and I'm happy to report that my wife's on the same journey. And, and with that fact, I'm just lucky that she's on the same journey. Because if she wasn't, that might be that 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 double load might be too too heavy of a load for me to carry. Too lonely of a place for me to sit in day after day. You know how we talk about. I, in fact, I talk about this with my team at work. I talk about this when I teach, when I write. That there's no generic solution. I love this next quote. I love this next quote from Carl Jung. 
as reported by James Hollis. He says, we cannot live the afternoon of life, meaning the second half of life, according to the program of life's morning. We cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. For what was great in the morning will be little at evening. And what in the morning was true will at evening become a lie. Today's answers will be tomorrow's constraints that he's, he says, he explains. You can come to some great awareness or epiphany today. But tomorrow will be bigger. And in Jungian therapy, soul is, is, is a metaphor. In Christianity or, or, or in other religions, the religion I was raised in, which was Christianity, and some other religion, soul is thought to be this, this physical reality, right? This ghost-like reality. You could possibly see a soul. But in Jungian therapy and, and, and psychodynamic therapy in Joseph Campbell's thinking, soul is a metaphor for, <clears throat> for the deeper parts of ourselves. Soul is in contrast to ego. Ego is the part of ourself that's just trying to manage things. The part, the conscious part of ourself that, that's trying to make decisions. And, and, well, I can't fight people when I'm angry, but I can play football. You know? Um, we find ways to kind of compromise between these, these drives that we have uh, of anger and, and, and other things. And, try to find acceptable ways to doing them or, or ways that, that we, that, that, that meet our needs. Soul is deeper. So is pole. So soul is, is what writes poetry and, and music. It's what paints it. Even if you're not in the artistic profession in your, in your job, when you find profound truths, when you're in, in a flow state, right? When you, maybe you're giving a presentation, and you've studied hard, you've been doing it for a while, and so it just comes out of you, comes through you. That's the experience. That's a soul experience. Soul is about expansion through suffering. And ego is about, is, is about limiting and managing. So there's no solution that today that will be adequate for the questions of tomorrow. It's not how it works. Learning to live with ambiguity, Hollis says, is learning to live with how life really is, full of complexities and strange surprises. There's no generic solution or, or steps that answer all the questions. There's no prescription. I, I can't answer questions about what you should do. I just can't. I can't tell you 10 things that if you do, that everything will work out. That's not even the goal. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be good. That would be miserable. That would be how actually. Although the child part of us thinks that it would be heaven. But this terribly painful, scary, confusing, difficult task of being in relationship to the people that we love, if we st stick with it, it we, we expand. And again, for those of you that are brand new, it might feel like I'm just speaking Greek. And if that's the case, go back to some of my other broadcasts and listen, because this one might not be the right one. But if you've been at this for a little while, you know what I'm talking about. You've tasted it. You've seen the, the sun come through the clouds. You've had moments where you've discarded a, a, a lifelong held belief. And you found freedom and peace. And like one gentleman said to me at an intensive four or five years ago, the minute that one of the most closely and longest held beliefs that I had, the minute that I found that it was of no use to me anymore, I was terrified to consider that all of my beliefs were up for grabs. That's why people in the middle passage look crazy. That's why they make ridiculous decisions and quit, quit their Wall Street job and become a ceramics teacher at the local community college. Right, A couple that, that has been married for 35 years and the kids have moved out of the house and the wife who's been the stay-at-home mom decides I want to have a career and I don't want to live in this patriarchal system anymore. 
And she seems crazy to the husband and to the family. But those of us who have experienced it look on with curiosity and wonder and not knowing. And, and the not knowing is one of the signs of, of the second half of life. One of the signs, signs of the second half of life is you have less advice than you used to. In fact, almost none. It's non-judgment. It is based on humility, which, by the way, as I wrote on social media just the other day, humility is based on confidence and a sense of self. People that are humble, which is really the, the, the in psychological terms, the, the, the gift of, of suffering, of failure, of struggle, is humility. Not pain and torture, but humility. So in the second half of life, what I've learned as a therapist is, is I don't know. What I realized after taking a month off and coming back and working with families right away is I don't feel arrogant about this work. Somebody says to me today, should I do this or this or this or this or this with my child? And I say, I don't know. We can go over all of those and talk about the pros and cons, but ultimately, I don't know what you're comfortable with and what you need and what's okay with you. And I definitely don't know how to control the child. The ego wishes for comfort, security. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Is that, do I pronounce it satiety? The soul demands meaning, struggle, and becoming. I know what satiety means, but I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Satiation, right? To be to be filled and, and to feel um, completed. The soul demands meaning. As I will read a little bit later, the, the, the ticket to this life is anxiety and doubt. But a lot of people are attracted to dogma and absolutes and answers because then the anxiety goes away. And somebody tells them the way that they live their life and here are all the shoulds you should do. And, and they believe that person or that group and they think problem solved. This work that I'm talking about doesn't work that way. We lean into the anxiety, into the doubt, right? Hollis talks about fear and lethargy as gremlins that sit at the foot of our bed and that we wake to every morning. He says, the daily confrontation with these gremlins, fear and lethargy, obliges us to choose between anxiety and depression. For each is abused, or each is aroused by the dilemma of daily choice. Anxiety will be our companion if we risk the next stage of our journey, and depression our companion if we do not. If you're struggling in a depression or anxiety, Hollis encourages you to, to find out what those things are trying to tell you. The exact same things that we teach about your children. We, want, we don't want to fix their symptoms. That would be a mistake. That would be what a young therapist would do. That would be what I used to try to do all the time. But rather, we want to listen to those behaviors. Listen to that depression. As the Buddhist monk Thich, Thich Nhat Hanh says, we listen to our depression and our anxiety like we would a crying baby. And we say, I am here for you. What do you need from me? And in, in Hollis's idea is that, that part of what happens is a lot of people accept the wrong explanations for life. The people that suffer lifelong misery have accepted inadequate answers to the meaning of life and have not gone into their own forest to find them. Anxiety, like I just described, he says, anxiety is the price of the ticket to life. Intrapsychic depression is the byproduct of our refusal to climb aboard. I love this quote because it's simple. 
Fear not others is the enemy. What Star Wars was trying to show us, what George Lucas was trying to, to show us in Star Wars was that fear is the devil. Literally. That our fear, living by fear, ruins it. It's not that fear is is something that we ignore, right, or repress or, or, or medicate away. But rather, if we allow it to, to, to live in us and the, and the subsequent anger and hatred that comes from it, we will ruin our own lives. That's the, the story of Darth Vader. He, he lost his wife. He didn't want to lose her. He went to the dark side. It's all just a metaphor for all of our lives. It's not, it's not fiction, really. It's a parable. He didn't want to lose his, his wife. He, he did lose his wife. And he vowed to never hurt again. And that caused the suffering of, of virtually the rest of his life. And, and by the way, not just his suffering, but the, the countless murders of the other people, which are symbolic of the people we hurt when we haven't healed. And the only thing that woke the character up was the love of his son. Or, probably more accurately, the love of himself as a child, as a young boy who was lost long ago after the death of his mother. And the reason I use Star Wars so frequently is because it was an intentional attempt to explain what I'm talking about tonight. It wasn't accidental. Speaking of the lion's stage of life, that, that, that age from around 18 to, to 40, where we're producing and we're out there creating our lives, the lion's job eventually is to kill the dragon named Thou Shalt. That's just poetic language to say that we have to learn to get rid of good and bad, right and wrong, to become ourselves. That those ideas that, that are oftentimes embedded and supported by, by religious dogma are the things that are keeping us stuck. Right? Like Rumi said, you know, out, be I, out beyond the field of wrongdoing and right doing. There's a place and I will meet you there. We, we in psychology offers us a road out of the, the right and wrong and the evil and good. It doesn't make us amoral. It makes us actually more moral. Because it, we, we are now then living in a place of love and expansion and soul instead of a place of ear, ego and, and fear and anger and, and hatred. The lion's job, Joseph Campbell says, is to kill the dragon named Thou Shalt. When it has been killed, all the energy that had been caught up in the dragon is now yours. People in midlife who are still expecting benefits from being good or punishment from being bad are delayed. I'm going to read that last part again. People in midlife who are still expecting benefits from being good or punishment for being bad, are delayed. That's what Job, the story of Job, was trying to teach us. It's really the uh, key feature of codependency. See, we codependent people, we do good things for people. And we hope and believe that if we do good, they'll do good back to us. And they don't. And then we end up resentful. And we, we begin to, to occupy a pattern that some recall, some refer to as the victim sense. I don't particularly like that too much, but that helpless, I can't. I was reading today in, in, in one of Hollis's books about how, you know, he moved to Zurich to, to, at 40 years old to become a, a Jungian analyst. And he had no money and the money that he thought he had wasn't coming. And he had to clean toilets in, in Switzerland. He said it wasn't just cleaning toilets. It was cleaning them, cleaning them to, 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 to the standard of Swiss clean. And of course, he reflected back about how his kids, kids look at that time of life as, a, as an adventure. Um, 
but part of that that transition that he went through as he entered into anal analysis and, and analytical training was um that's not the way that life you could do everything right and you could walk across the street and get hit by a bus and i know everybody knows that theoretically but it's it's true in a million small ways the only thing that you get out of doing good is doing good virtue is its own reward vice is its own punishment darth vader's punishment wasn't that he was arrested or, or, or jailed or or convicted of of, of crimes against uh, against others Darth Vader's punishment was his life had contracted. That's our punishment. And our children are, 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 are unconsciously, unwittingly asking to break us open and expand us. Life is not a disease, Hollis explains. And, neuros and a neurosis is not a cancer to be excised. Any seeming resolution today will have to be revised tomorrow for the psyche is a flowing river. And yesterday's resolution is tomorrow's constriction. You don't arrive. No matter how good a therapy session or a, a podcast or a book is, you don't arrive. Don't ever arrive. From the Gospel of St. Thomas, which is part of the, the, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in 1945, I believe, in, in a jar in a cave. From the Gospel of St. Thomas, this is a... a, a uh, a parchment that had what was uh, suggested or ascribed to to the words of Jesus Christ. And it sounds like a very different Jesus Christ than Christianity. It sounds a lot more like Buddha than it does the, the version of Jesus that we see in the canonized Christian scriptures today. In the Gospel of St. Thomas, Jesus said, If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. If you don't do your work, it will run your life. If you don't unravel your history, it will, it will be in the driver's seat. If you don't deal with your history, you will sleep every night in history's unmade bed. There's no other way. And this weird kind of idea that's out there sometimes that we don't look back only serves to destroy us. And as Carl Jung explains, if we fail to work out our lives, uh, the, the, the issues will come up in our lives and we will just call it fate. But the story of the fates in Greek mythology, right? That's where that comes from. The story is, yes, they whisper in your ear and they tell you the way that it's going to be, but you can overcome the fates. You can overcome them like Psyche did when she met the challenges of Aphrodite. Or like Orpheus did when he went down to, to Hades to, to, to find his lover. You can overcome the fates. But it takes a, a, a heroic, painful journey inward. Jung defined neurosis as suffering which has not discovered its meaning. Indeed, suffering seems to be a prerequisite for the transformation of consciousness. Elsewhere, Jung suggested neuroses is an inauthentic suffering. Authentic suffering requires encounters with dragons. Inauthentic suffering implies flight from them. A couple of typos on that. Inauthentic suffering implies flight from them. I love this. Let's see how many. I, I think this is my, I'm all, I have one more slide. I love this. This is from the middle passage. James Hollis says this, living together on a daily basis, remorselessly wears away the projections. One is left with the otherness of the other who will not and cannot meet the largeness of the projections. Your children won't complete you. They won't make you happy. It's not their job, never was. Your spouse either. So people, going on to what Hollis says, I'm going to read that again. One is left with the otherness of the other who will not and cannot meet the largeness of the projections. So people will conclude in midlife that 
You are not the person I married. Actually, they never were, Hollis explains. They were always somebody else, a stranger we barely knew then and know only a little bit better now. The call of evoke, the call of a struggling child, I believe that's the only sense I can make out of it. You have to figure it out on your own. The only sense I can make out of it is the call is to the second half of life. To find a deeper meaning. Not the meaning that we were told, not the purpose that we were taught, but to find our own meaning. As Campbell said, it's often symbolized in storytelling and mythology by going into a forest or a dark place or a cave where there's no path. Because if there's a path, it's somebody else's. Or as one beautiful quote I read from a mystic said, seek not the paths of the mystics. Don't do what they did, but seek what they sought. If people always sought the, 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 the path of those that went before them, we wouldn't have Monet or Picasso or the Beatles because people would just be keeping making the same music over and over. I know there are some, some, some comments. Um, I know there's some comments and some questions and somebody told me how to pronounce that word. Thank you very much for that. Um, satiety. I think I said it close. Um, but I'm going to take those on my next Q and a, and I'm just going to wrap up with announcements. My two books, the journey of the heroic parent and the audacity to be you are available both on Amazon and audible. I read the audacity. If you want to make a contribution to people that, that can't afford therapy, can't afford treatment. Uh, our three partners are choose mental health.org sky's the limit fund.org or evoke family foundation.org. We have support groups for current and alumni families of both our wilderness and our intensives program, uh, tomorrow night at 6 30 PM for wilderness current and alumni families. August 23rd is for alumni of wilderness only and intensives, uh, online, uh, support groups, August 9th at 6 PM contact Malia at evoke therapy.com for more information or to find out and register. If you want to do a deep dive in your own work, finding you, is a place to start August 10th. I believe it's full. You can always check September 7th is the next offering after August 10th. Um, we also have an online offering August 26th. It's less money and less time. So it still is a wonderful, wonderful program, but we've kind of cut it in half and, and made it over a weekend and reduced the price quite significantly. If you've done any of the finding use and you want to do another one returning to you October 12th through 16th, I will be running that contact intensives at evoketherapy.com. If you want a coach that is that is educated in, in attachment-based therapy, the therapy that we talk about at Evoke, contact coaching at evoketherapy.com. Pursuit trips are three to 30-day trips for adults or families. Think therapy light or therapy fun. It can be customized for anywhere in the world with any kinds of activities. Sarah at evoketherapy.com is the place to go. We ask all current parents to try six 12-step support groups while they're with us. Start now. Any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, or Adult Children, you can go to their websites. They have online offerings also. RefugeRecovery.org is also a place you can go. It's a Buddhist-inspired recovery program, less of an emphasis on a higher power. And the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI.org, is a place you can go to get free education and support in your local community. All of these broadcasts are available by searching Finding You and Evoke Therapy Podcast on your favorite podcast app or Spotify, or you can go to SoundCloud.com on your computer. They're also available as videos on Evoke's YouTube channel. You can find Evoke and me, Brad Reedy, on Twitter and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. Or you can find Evoke Intensives on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And you can also go to the Evoke Therapy blog for new information and content each week. Thank you for joining me. It's so wonderful to be back. I did enjoy my time off and I am. Also thrilled to be back talking to you this evening. My next broadcast will be August 8th at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time, a live Q&A for participants, alumni, family, and friends of Evoke. And then August 10th, I'll be talking about why wilderness and how does it work. Thank you for joining me this evening. As always, thank you for and on behalf of the people that you love and care about for doing your own work and showing up. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.